Faith family, welcome to online worship. We are so glad that you are joining us from wherever you are at. And I just want to say for those of you watching online, you are just as much a part of our church family as those worshiping with us in person. So welcome. Uh, if it's your first time uh, checking us out, uh, we are so glad that you are here and uh, we are excited to get to know you. And so we would love to have you go to our website, fclc.org, and click on the connect button tab and fill out some information about you so that we can get to know you and send you information about all the great things that God has going on here at Faith Community. As we begin our worship service, let's begin by confessing our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, be made strong in the Savior's love and through the It's all good. He is risen. The risen Lord is here. Let's not forget that. The risen Lord is here. Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us this morning. As Lucas said, we have a lot of guests with us this morning. So Shannon, nice to have you with us this morning as a guest. And also Rod and Laura from Northfield, Minnesota. Guess where I'm going tomorrow? Northfield, Minnesota, all week. So... What a small, small, small world this is, right? And you'll be there on Tuesday, back at the hospital there, or back at the clinic there. Wonderful to have you with us. And then I also met a Bob and Kathy too. I think, unless I chase them away, are they still? There they are, Bob and Kathy, who just moved here from Virginia. And, and get this, they've been listening to us online. And so they already knew who, who Lucas was and who I am and whatnot. And then they're, they're going to a second church today. Boo. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. No, 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 you're doing it right. You're really, really taking it seriously and exploring. So we're glad that you're with us here this morning as we worship the risen Lord in this season of Easter, this 50-day season of Easter where we celebrate the risen Lord for a week of weeks. And it is our hope and our prayer and our goal that we might encounter the risen Lord too as we worship, as we hear the gospel, and as we serve together. So let's take a closer look. If you'd open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, it's the Easter story according to Luke. And we'll pick it up right at the very end of that first Easter morning, verse 11. And I believe we have verse 11 up here. Let's, let's read this together. And let me just help you out a little bit. It's good to have your Bible open, especially today. It's good to have your Bible open, page 15, 20. Page 15, 20. There's a little map I want you to look at there too. 1520. But verse 11 says this. Let's read it together. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense? That's kind of a strong word, isn't it? Nonsense. It isn't that they just found it hard to believe. It seemed to them like nonsense. We see doubt at the very beginning of the Easter story. But the good news is... I think for us, when we struggle with our doubts, the good news is even the disciples at first thought it, thought it, the resurrection, was a fairy tale. Didn't Reza have a great message last week on doubt? And I love the title of his message. The problem with doubt is not doubt. And he went on to dignify our doubts, and explain that our doubts need not be a dead end in our faith, but rather our doubts may lead us to faith. And that's exactly what we see on that first Easter morning, isn't it? We see lots of doubt. And so the angel, the, the angel gives his message to the women, and then they run off to tell the others, and then Peter goes to the tomb, and Peter ponders what the meaning of the empty tomb is. We see Faith slowly unfolding throughout the story on that first Easter, kind of like the colors of springtime are slowly unfolding now. It's getting greener and greener, and we're starting to see blossoms on some of the trees, and we're starting to see some flowers pop up. Similarly, in the Easter story, on that first Easter, we see faith slowly unfolding from the disciples. They move from fear 
fear and grief and confusion to hope, hope and amazement and joy. And then that leads us to the next part of the story on the road to Emmaus. And let's go ahead, Kirk, let's go ahead and read the whole story. Yeah, we'll, re we'll read that. And let's read verse 13 together, then I'll, I'll whip through the rest of the story real quickly there. Verse 13 says this, let's read it. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And here's the rest of the story. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in those days, these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer all these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broken, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord is risen. He has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it right in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It ends with this. You are witnesses of all these things. I'm going to send you what my father's promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So we too pray that our eyes might be opened to see life with Easter eyes. I've got this picture here from my office. You've seen this before. It's a very common artist rendition. You knew this wasn't a photograph, right? This, this is an artist rendition, and it's up on the screen here. And I, and I love this picture. I mean, if you're stressed out, just take a few moments to, to breathe deeply and to look at that beautiful picture. Doesn't it just give you a sense of peace? The trees and the clouds and the, the setting sun. And if you look at, if you, if you did open your Bibles, as I asked you to do, if you did open your Bibles, you see the little map in your Bible there? So where's Emmaus? It's what direction from Jerusalem? It's west. It's about seven miles west. So about as far as we are from Lyons. Maybe about a two-hour walk. I mean, we don't know 
if the path was that smooth or rocky or up or down or whatever. But there's been a lot of speculation why they didn't recognize Jesus. Because, I mean, you look at this artist's rendition, I mean, that's clearly Jesus. I mean, anybody, you don't even have to be a Christian to know that's Jesus. But maybe, maybe, maybe it was darker so they couldn't tell. Or maybe the sun was really in their eyes so they couldn't tell. Or maybe Jesus was wearing a hoodie. You know, we know he wasn't wearing a baseball cap or sunglasses, but you know, in those days they did wear hoods oftentimes. Who knows? But Luke does give us a little bit of a count, a little bit of a hint here, that there may be a deeper, more spiritual reason. Verse 16, I think is interesting, but they were kept from recognizing him. What in the world does that mean? They were kept from, did, 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 did the Lord blur their vision? Or more likely, was their vision blurred by their lack of faith? Was their vision blurred by PTSD? Was their vision blurred by the horror of the resurrection, that they just, or of the, of the crucifixion, that they just could not get out of their minds, so that the very last thing that they expected to see was the risen Lord, but they were kept from recognizing him. Who knows? So Jesus, Jesus is kind of playing coy with them here. He says, what are, you, what are you talking about? He had to know what they were talking about. He's Jesus, he's God. He, he knew, but he's playing with them there. So they tell the whole story, and he patiently listens to the whole story. And uh, of course, we Cleopas there says, are, are, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that does not know these things? You thought your kids invented sarcasm? Or your grandkids? No, it was Cleopas. He, he invented sarcasm. And I don't know if it's very good to be sassy with Jesus, but he, you know, are you the only one in Jerusalem that does not know of the things that took place? So Jesus, he's playing with them, as he always does. He's asking a question. He's answering a question with a question. So they tell the story. And then after they have told their story, he challenges their version of the story. He challenges their perspective. In verse... 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all the pro what all the prophets have spoken. Now I ask you, that's really a nice pastoral response, isn't it? I mean, if you went into your pastor's office and you had a very, very sad story about somebody that you cared about a lot who died, and the pastor were to say, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken, how do you think that would go over? How do you think that would go over today? Probably not very well. The pastor called me a fool. I went into his office. He called me a fool and said I was slow to believe. But in all, all fairness here, maybe something gets lost in the translation a little bit. It's, it's hard to interpret tone all the time, isn't it? And, and maybe, maybe Jesus' response wasn't as harsh as it sounds to us here. Maybe Jesus' tone was more like a, a, a loving kind friend that, that, that says, listen, friend, there's more to the story. There's, there's more to the story. You don't have all the facts here. So that Jesus helps them to see what had happened in a whole new way. That there is more to the story here. And he helps them to see what had happened in a whole new way. Sometimes it's hard to see clearly What's happened? And sometimes it's hard to see clearly what, 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 what's going on and what God will yet do. Last weekend, um, we, were, we were in Fredericksburg, Texas for the eclipse, visiting Cindy's brother and his wife in a wonderful German community. And we had the joy of worshiping at Bethany Lutheran, Lutheran Church. Great church, great pastors there. Very, 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 very friendly guys and wonderful. And the pastor was kind of a jokester. He began the service. Welcome to our worship on this second Sunday in the season of the apocalypse. I mean, the season of the eclipse. I mean, the season of Easter there. The eclipse has been a big deal, the talk of the town for a long, long, long time. They had porta potties set up everywhere in the town. They were expecting masses from all over the world to, to be there. And so he went on in his sermon to tell a story about how, when he was a little boy, his grandma had cataract surgery. 
And apparently her cataracts were pretty serious and had really, really compromised her vision. And, and apparently the surgery was very, very successful, so it immediately improved her vision dramatically. So much so that when she went home that day and she looked in her closet to her wardrobe, she was horrified. I've been wearing that! But her family was very, very kind. Well, Grandma, we just thought you had kind of unique tasting clothes, you know. <laughs> but then later that night, when she stood out in the yard, looking up to the stars, she said, I had forgotten. I had forgotten how beautiful, how beautiful the stars are. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Sometimes we need help to see things clearly. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need cataract surgery. Sometimes we need new glasses to see clearly. Sometimes, some, but sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes we don't want to see things very clearly. Uh, I, my dad had a, a plaque on his desk. My dad was a pastor, too. He had a plaque on his desk that had a little cartoon, and the cartoon said this, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's already made up. We sometimes do that, don't we? We do. We do that. Aren't we? we're, we're already mad. We're sad. We're upset about something. And we really don't want any more, fa any more facts. And in fact, that'll probably just make us madder. We just want to be mad. But I have a friend that says facts matter. Facts matter. So Jesus shares new facts, new information with the disciples that help them to see the crucifixion in a whole new way. Sometimes we need help to see clearly, to watch the eclipse. Cindy's brother Mike, he had, of course, solar eclipse uh, glasses all prepared for us to watch the eclipse. And, and I gotta be honest, I, 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 you know, I've seen so many pictures of the eclipse, you know, on pictures and magazines and TV and everything, so I, I didn't think it was that big a deal. The forecast was supposed to be for clouds, so my expectations were very, very low. But I was blown away. God of wonders, beyond our galaxy, how magnificent it was. Those glasses not only protected our vision, they also helped us to see clearly. Jesus' teaching helped the disciples see more clearly what the crucifixion was all about, that it was necessary that it was a part of God's larger plan. They thought it was a big fail, a horrible fail, but it was actually part of a larger plan. And so that leads us to the rest of the story. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he, poof, disappeared from, from their sight. Did you get the poof when you read the story? Poof. He disappeared from their sight. So what, what happened there? I mean, they left immediately. They left immediately. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Verse 33, they found the 11 and those with them there assembled together. And uh, they told Cleopas and his companion, it's true, the Lord has risen. The women told us. And then they say, when he appeared to us, and they explained how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And get this, while he was talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. Poof again. How did that happen? How did he do that? I mean, did, was he kind of stalking them all the way back to Jerusalem? Probably about a two-hour walk, probably, if they're walking briskly. It was in the dark, probably, at this point. Was he stalking behind them, or, or was he spiritually teleported or transfigured somehow? We don't know. But Jesus then stood among them, and notice what he says. He says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, I ask you this. If a dead guy suddenly appeared in front of you in the middle of the night and said, peace be with you, do you think there would be peace with you? <laughs> Probably not. Probably just the opposite. So no surprise, the very next verse says, they were startled, you think? They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? He knew why they were troubled. And, and why, why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and blood as you see I have. And then he, and he, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
And while they still did not believe because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? He gave them, they gave him a piece of a broiled fish, fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Jesus says, shalom to them. Peace be with you. Jesus' teaching helped them see the crucifixion in a whole new way. And so verse 44 says, this is what I told you. While I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Lucas, uh, and, and so the third point, I don't think I've even said the third point yet, have I? We pray, may our minds be open to see God's larger plan. Jesus helps them see that the crucifixion was part of a larger plan. Lucas just found out on Friday, this is, this is breaking news, Found out on Friday that his two last big projects for seminary had been approved. So now, now he's pretty much done. He's, he's pretty much done. He's, he's this close to getting his MDiv. So yay for Lucas. Yay for Lucas. This is a big deal. This has been a big deal. He's been working on this at least four years. And so we want to properly recognize this achievement. And so more information in the next uh, few weeks, next couple of months, we'll have some celebrations. But that reminded me of a paper that I had written when I was in seminary. So I dug up this paper that I had written while I was in seminary, and it happened to be on this very text, on this very story. And so I, 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 I read through it, and I have to say, you know, it was so boring. <laughs> I almost put myself to sleep reading my own paper. And, and the most embarrassing part is I, I could barely understand what I said. I mean, the internal and external evidence from the Greek suggests that we could interpret it this way. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, who wrote this? I don't even, I don't even understand what I said. So I showed it, showed it to Lucas. I said, you know, this is what I had to do when I was in seminary, you know. And, and I had to walk 10 miles uphill, you know, every day and both ways. And, and first thing Lucas said when he looked at my paper was, did you write this on a typewriter? <laughs> Now, I have to say, I was impressed he even knew what a typewriter was. Because he, he's so young. You know, I wrote this in 1978. I, that was like 10 years before Lucas was born. 10 years before he was born. So, but, 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 uh, so I could barely understand what I wrote. I mean, I thought it was so boring. But the good news is, the professor loved it. He loved it. David Titi, David Titi, loved it, who went on to become the president of Luther Seminary. So that's all that matters. That's all, it's, it's all about pleasing the professor, isn't it? I mean, that's all that matters. No, no offense to those of you that are professors. Actually, I shouldn't make professor jokes because Bruce is here. Bruce could have been a very, very fine professor. But uh, anyway, the professor loved it. And the main, the main big idea in this paper was, it was based largely on just, the whole paper was like on verse 44. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of the prophets the, and the Psalms and the law of Moses. The, the Greek word day, three, three letters, Greek word day. It was necessary. That is the big thrust in this, in this passage here. Again, the disciples thought that the crucifixion was a big fail, and it, and it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, sometimes we have big plans, don't we? We have big plans, and it falls apart. And then, you know, hopefully somebody comes to the rescue. So it wasn't like Jesus' mission fell apart and, and ended in a big train wreck with his death on the cross. No, just, and then God comes to the rescue and resurrects him. No, it wasn't that at all. It was necessary to fulfill all that had been written. It was necessary that Jesus die, suffer and die, so that he might defeat death. It was necessary so that Jesus might show that he has victory over death. It was necessary. So Jesus' teaching helped them to see the situation in a whole new way. I just finished reading David Zoll's book, uh, Low Anthropology. I can finally get it back to, uh, back to Dennis here. Where's Dennis this morning? Dennis, you're, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, actually, I'm passing it on to Lucas so he can read it. Because we're going to hear David Zoll at a pastor's conference next month. So is that okay? A little bit, little bit longer. Great, great book. Great book. And, and the stories within the book itself are worth it in itself. 
He tells a story about a young woman whose parents died when she was a young adult. Her her dad died in a car accident when, when she was 16, and then her mom, about 10, 12 years later, died of alcoholism. And to be honest, she almost felt relief when they were gone, because she had always, and she was an only child, she'd always found them to be rather distant emotionally and, and, and hard to understand. Till one day she found a box of letters that they had written each other when they were young, and she was blown away by the affection with which they wrote to each other. And she found herself saying, who were these people? I hardly knew them. So she made it her mission to get to know her parents. She went back to her mother's hometown and her mother's home neighborhood, and she learned that her mother's childhood had been full of heartbreak, abuse, and abandonment. And then she even flew to the Ukraine where her father immigrated from, and she learned that her father over there was considered a hero. All these trips he had taken back to the Ukraine, she interpreted as absenteeism and abandonment of her as a girl. But really, it was devotion to his home people, his home community. She also learned that she had had an older brother who who, who died in infancy of pneumonia. It was heartbreaking to learn all these things, but she came to see it as a gift as a gift, as she came to see her parents in a whole new way and to see them with grace and mercy and love. Verse 44 says, and their eyes were opened and their minds were opened. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Sometimes it's just hard to see the story clearly. When the disciples encountered the risen Lord, it changed everything. It changed everything. As we face all the changes in our world today, as we face all the challenges in our world today, as we face scary headlines in the world today, may we find peace and comfort and hope in the risen Lord who goes before us in all things, the risen Lord who is here, who is here, who goes before us in all things, who promises to never leave us nor forsake us, to never leave us nor forsake us, the risen Lord who is faithful, who is mighty to save. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you, thank you, thank you for the courageous witness of those first disciples, those first followers of Jesus who were so consumed by grief and doubt and confusion. And yet their doubts led them to faith. And we see faith awakening. So awaken faith in us today. As Chaz said earlier, it's so easy to find things to complain about. Oh, we're good at that sometimes. Help us to see the risen Lord in our midst. Help us to be comforted that he is with us, that he is with us right here, that he goes before us in all things. May we be witnesses now today, 2,000 years later. May we be witnesses. May we be alert this afternoon, alert tomorrow, alert this week to opportunities to share the good news of Jesus and his love. And all God's people said, Amen. As we celebrate Holy Communion today, we invite you to use whatever you have available in your home setting, whether that would be bread or crackers or grape juice or wine. We invite you to join us as we remember again the words of institution, that it was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And again, in the same manner, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. So take and drink the blood of Christ 
shed for you. Please join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.